Hey everybody, welcome to the book leads impactful books for life and leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jermillo. This podcast series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives and work and businesses of my network and extended network. I want to get to those books that have made the most impact in that network uh, and on everything they touch, every world they operate in, um, just books that have really stood out and made that kind of impact. So these are great leads to get to those books. Uh, and I want to see which ones have contributed the most to everything they do. So the three types of books that I cover are uh, the first category, a book that I've never read that they're sharing with me. The second category, a book that we've both read, whether specifically for this series or in our previous lives. And then the third category is where I interview authors and publishers who are trying to get their the messages of the books that they're putting out there out into this audience. So for this particular episode, my guest will be Patricia Ortega. And Patricia is a master's level career counselor and coach with a decade of professional experience. Her mission is to use everything she's learned to help career seekers overcome mindset challenges and walk out their career goals. She helps people explore options and strategically navigate their career journey. Through the power of coaching, she also helps candidates develop a professional brand and communicate signature strengths so they can become more confident and sought after professionals. She's also a Christian, wife, dog mom, and of course, host of the Uncommon Career Podcast. And I was introduced to Patricia by Aaron Harrigan, who's a guest on episode 55 of this series, in which Aaron covers her book, Pursuing Success God's Way, A Practical Guide to Hustle with Heart. So Patricia, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so before we start, who are you today? If you could kind of give me a breakdown of the work that you do. Um, just to kind of get a sense of what it is you bring to the table, the the value that you provide to your clients. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a career coach and just uh, was a tenured faculty member at a college and I worked at universities and with engineers that are up and coming and whatnot. And so the bulk of my work is really around that mindset piece. Um, you know, there's many folks that work on resumes and help you with the interview. Um, but I'm of the mindset that once you figure out the worth of your work and how valuable your unique traits are, everything else kind of takes care of itself. So it's getting into that mindset first. And then the resume just flows out of that. The interview confidence flows out of that. The negotiations, the networking conversations, everything flows out of that. And so that's really the work that I do now is just career coaching to help people understand, communicate, and market their work value so that they can get jobs that truly reflect what they have to offer. So. And before we get um, into the book and everything else, to understand how you ended up here, what did your career path look like mm -hmm. from the moment you start thinking about career, whether it's high school, before, uh, what was it that put you on that trajectory to start to begin your career? Even if it didn't mean you were going to end up where you are now, sometimes you yeah. can't predict those kind of things, but how did your story start in terms of career? Yeah, gosh. So, I mean... It so I grew up in a kind of a chaotic home. My mom suffers from a mental illness. There was a lot of abuse in the home, all kinds of crazy things, right? And so I've been coming out of this life um, and career comes in when I start to go to, I go to end up going to college by the grace of God and we're moving forward, just taking classes. And, and now it's like, well, what are you going to do after you graduate? And there was a dean of students who essentially became like my second mom. She just kind of took me under her wing. And there was a point where she said, okay, you have to um, now get an internship because eventually you'll get a full-time job and your internship means a lot for your full-time job. So there was this really prestigious internship. It was called the James Bell internship. It was like it for everyone who wanted to work in student affairs. And so I – was like, I'm not going to apply. It's not for me. This is for the the big, you know, the go-getter students, the students who are going to be successful and blah, blah, blah. Well, she has me apply anyways, and I end up getting an interview. And now in my mind, she's pulled some strings, you know, in my mind, like there's no way I would get an interview unless somebody says something to somebody else and that somebody has to be pretty important. And so that's what I thought in my mind. So I, I go into the interview and I'm nervous as all get out because till then I've had nothing but fast food jobs and I just go to the bottom of the food chain and scrape up what no one else wants, you know? And so I go in there and I'm really, really nervous. I'm like tapping my foot. I'm chewing gum. I'm just like scratching. Like I'm just so anxious. And I go into the room, the lady, she's very, everybody's very nice, very nice lady. 
She's like, okay, it's your turn. And I'm like, ugh. <laughs> so I go into the room and I see this tall, older white man suited up with a deep voice. He happened to be the vice president at the time. And then I see this slender, um, you know, well taken care of, well manicured, sophisticated woman with glasses. And she's really sweet. But I can tell immediately there's a big difference between me and them. And so I sit down and the very sophisticated woman very nicely asks me, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and start with the first question. Um, so tell us about yourself. But I, at that time, literally had so much emotional junk from my past. And this was my first semi-professional position. I had never been in a room with someone with suits, you know, this whole thing. And I just, all I heard was tell me about yourself. Like I can see right through you. You're totally damaged. Like explain to us how you are going to fit in here. And I just, I just broke down crying. And I was like, what? 19 years yeah. old at the time. So here's this 19 year old falling apart at the tell me about yourself question in an interview. And so of course I, of course I didn't get the job. So I excuse myself and I go into the elevator and that was the moment. Like I'm in the elevator, I'm hyperventilating and I'm just like, I am always going to be in survival mode. Like that was the mm. moment where I was like, I'm never going to make anything of myself. I'm just going to be living on friends' couches for the rest of my life. Like I have to, I can't be in survival mode. And so if I'm not going to be in survival mode, I didn't know about all the different avenues to make money back then. I just knew a career. And so I was like, if I'm going to get out of this, I need to like figure out. I need to become career savvy. I need to be able to be in rooms with people that don't look like me or that I think are this or that or whatever. I need to be able to figure out what I'm good at, present it, and be able to basically sell and market myself to move up, right? And so since then, I got a master's degree in um, – higher education counseling with the focus working on with underrepresented students, focusing on resiliency, focusing on communication, focusing on student success, um, just anything about making your life, your career, and your education successful, like that's what I focused on. Um, and then I started finding my areas, you know, the places where I tend to shine the most and it tends to be you know, this communication piece, this like connecting your mindset with the way you speak, the way you carry yourself, and then bringing that into you know, make using that to make your life better. And it kind of came together at career that I just, you know, when you work with someone, you realize, oh, this comes to me really naturally. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what guided me into career. And it's worked amazingly. I mean, there's folks that I work with that were an Amazon driver and making 30K a month, hadn't worked in engineering for five years, thought it was over, thought he had nothing, he could never go back because it had been so long. And he went from a 30K job to an 89K like in one step. And now I think he's over a hundred grand, you know, like, and it's, it's people who come to me and they're like, you know, I freeze up at interviews and I don't understand why. And, and I work with them and, and that's really like the crux of where, you know, all my experiences have, has come together. Um, so if that helps. That yeah, absolutely. Question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And I just pause for a moment just because we think in, in, in every school, every university, the preparation is going to be different. So I can't speak mm -hmm. for everything that I've seen, but it's amazing how all through schooling from the start to the to high school, say, we're not really good at telling our story. You mm -hmm. know, um, we're, we're not good at it. We have it. We don't think it's worth sharing. We, we may think that other people's stories are better than ours. I think for me specifically, my eyes opened up to how important storytelling is during the pandemic because more mm -hmm. people were coming out of their shells because they were in their environments. They felt comfortable. You know, they were on Zoom. Um, they were desperate for human interaction. We were missing that human interaction. So it just seemed like people were opening up more. But back to the education, it just doesn't seem more like we're good at telling our stories. And, you know, when when a 19 year old goes in and somebody says, tell me about yourself, tell me what you're all about. Um, obviously, the reaction is going to be different, but it, it could have gone different ways. Even if, mm -hmm. if you didn't shut yourself down, it could have gone a different way where we could prepare somebody to look back at their story. Because I've yeah. I've helped coach in, at universities where they were training people or training students, um, you know, mocktail interviews and things like that, where some of them were like, I, I have nothing to author, uh, offer mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm a student, 
Uh, I'm a student athlete. I have nothing to author. This I, I haven't had a job, so I have nothing to author. Meanwhile, you know, I dig a little deeper in this kid that I'm talking to in, the, in a particular case. He's the captain of the, the baseball team. You know, yeah. so sports is about leadership. It's about discipline. It's about commitment. But we don't know how to shape that particular story. Uh, mm -hmm. And even even adults, even leadership coaching, you see adults that um, they're playing to a job description, but they don't know enough to bring their story, their experience, their wants, mm -hmm. desires, what they're about to to that job. It's amazing how much we leave behind because we were never really taught about the importance of our own story. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's the piece that I think is opening up a lot more just the traditional, you know, and I come out of education, you know, so much love to every single educator, right? But like the way it's set up, you know, it's this system of you take information and the authority is the person at the front of the classroom and you don't have as much to give. You take information and then you give it back. And so I was taught this like way, right? And it was only through leadership activities, like co-curricular and stuff that actually started seeing some of my, you know, giftings and talents and things. But I feel like we're by default not necessarily taught to be entrepreneurial in all areas of life, not just if we own a business. And so even coming out of a tenured position, most recently I came out of a tenured position and I felt like I've known what to do every single day my whole life. And all of a sudden now I'm responsible for the outcome and the avenue to get there. And it's this entirely different way where I've noticed how similar entrepreneurship and career savviness are. It's really you create opportunities for yourself in learning who you are, who you serve, how you serve them, and how to communicate that forward. So I, I definitely, definitely agree that the storytelling piece is a life skill that needs to be taught at the high school level to begin with. Patricia, what what the people that you work with, what ages are we talking about? Is it mostly professionals? Do you uh, work with younger people at all? What what does that look like? That yeah. Career? I mean, I, I have the most experience with the, you know, college age students and helping them launch their careers. I go from entry level to mid career level. It's really that that point in your life when you're deciding who you are as a professional. Um, so whether it's launching your career or I, I've met with folks who have been in their career for five, six, seven years and are like, I'm only here because I picked a major when I was 18 and I just took a straight line. And I don't like yeah. where it's led me, right? And so you can reinvent Absolutely. yourself at any age, but especially if you're in your like 20s, late 20s, early 30s, I mean, sometimes people think, oh, it's too late. Vera Wang made her very first dress when she was 40. Like <laughs> it is yeah. not too late, you know? Like there's so many avenues, especially now the, the world has become so flat, you know, where on LinkedIn, you can reach out to someone and be in a circle you would never be in in person within just yeah. a conversation or two. Um, and so I think teaching folks just how flat the world is and helping them get into that mindset, that entrepreneurial mindset for their own career is um, it changes lives, I think. Yeah, I love how you talk about making making the world flat. Um, that's a great visual to to have about just the accessibility that you have. I mean, when I was out of college looking for a job, it was like monster.com or the newspaper. Yes. But now, um, I, even to this day, I was at a, an alumni event last week and somebody was worried that they were in that master's program that I had completed. Um, they didn't have any experience in the field they wanted to enter. So they were just curious about what that looks like. What are the options? Um, and I said, you know, you have LinkedIn, you have access to people. You can look at the title, see what you're into. I think she wasn't sure what she wanted to do. See mm -hmm. what's out there. You can reach out to somebody and say, this is my story. I'm just curious if we can have a virtual chat. Now somebody doesn't even need to take the time to, to, to drive somewhere to meet you. Now you can just, you know, chat by Zoom. We're so accustomed yeah. to just having these virtual talks pick their brain, ask them questions, ask them about themselves. What, what is it that they find? Where do they find the joy in the work that they do? What's the pain in the ass that, you know, they don't enjoy yeah. You know, people will, I think anybody worth their way in sharing knowledge and wisdom will take that call just to help someone out. Um, I've, I've mm -hmm. reached out to so many people. So many people have reached out to me. I've, I've explained that my networking has 
grown exponentially during the the pandemic because you go to these virtual events and it's not just a, a, a traditional networking event where it's like one-on-one -on -one and you have to repeat your story over and over again. You know, if there's a speaker, they speak and then everybody kind of chimes in with their ideas and then somebody will hear something you say and in the chat say, hey, that was a great point. Do you mind if we meet for coffee? So the landscape is just change. But like you said, it's all a matter of pointing that out to whoever's curious about what their next steps are, or if they're unsure what their next steps are. Yeah. And that's something I see a lot is folks being just unsure. And I was unsure too, you know, so to have a guide, right, which brings us into kind of the book that we're talking about, like to have a guide to say you have, and it's true, like you have everything you need. I don't care who it is that I'm talking about. I have yet to meet someone who doesn't have everything they need mm -hmm. to carve out space for themselves and their life. They just sometimes need a little bit of a guide to give confirmation and validation in those moments to say, yeah, you're onto something with this. Like from what you're, everything you're telling me, this is what I'm going to reflect back to you and, and having those points of confirmation. Am I doing the right thing? Is this, is this, you know, and as soon as you figure that out and you have that coach to do it that first time, I feel like it's a life skill that in my, you know, coaching practice, I would love to work myself out of a job that if I work with someone that's one of the best compliments that I've gotten is that someone's like, I never have to hire another career coach again because mm -hmm. I know and I'm confident and I can build my own opportunities. And, and that's really like what I work for. Yeah. I mean, it's that old uh, proverb, like teach a man to fish, you know, he can yeah. eat for, you know, if you give them, if you just make it easy for them, that's one thing. But if you prepare them with the tools of what they need and it has to keep evolving, but they have that curiosity to go out mm -hmm. there and look for the tools to do the research to not stop themselves. It's amazing for me in leadership coaching, just how much it's gone from talking about leadership to where they understand that more easily, but it's a matter of motivating and accountability yeah. and talking between session that it's more motivational than anything else. Because if somebody gets a leadership coach, I mean, they already have that curiosity. They already have that, that desire, most people to work in that direction, but it's a mm -hmm. matter of just kind of being that sounding board for them. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100% with that. So Patricia, does it make sense from your childhood to now that this is where you ended up and this is what you're doing now? You know what? I think it does. Um, I still, you know, I'm one of those folks, you know, those multi-passionate people that like loves doing a variety of things, right? And so Wait, it's one explain of those that, Explain where, that a little more for you. What does that mean for you? So multi-passionate to me is essentially, I guess by definition, is that you just, you enjoy a lot of different things, right? And, and you know, I do feel like I've gathered skills along the way that I put in my toolbox and I can make a hundred different machines with that one toolbox. And this is just the machine that I happen to be making right now. And this is how I want to help people right now. Um, and I know it would be, you know, um, maybe beneficial for me to say, I'm going to be a career coach till I retire. And I just don't think we live in a world where that is going to be the case for very many of us, it's, you know? It's and so as AI comes changed. in, oh, say yeah. it again. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I, ju I just think, you know, as AI comes in, part of me, like when I work with folks, it's like, yeah, we are going to build your resume, but I'm going to show you step by step how I build it out using AI so that when you build it out, it's faster. And so that you can do this, you don't have to hire a resume writer every time because you're going to learn the process. And so I think that's going to evolve the position. Then there's, you know, so many different resources to use to practice your interview. And so it's like, okay, I work with you to help you leverage those resources first to get you into the mindset the emotional intelligence, the, mm -hmm. you know, storytelling, the communication aspect, the mindset, the resiliency, the confidence, how to carry yourself, you know, who, you, what your identity is. Like I help you figure that piece out. And then I say, okay, let's help you leverage this, the resources and the technology that's here today so that you can, even after our session, even after our three months of coaching, you can just, I mean, it's a, it's a speedway. You can just go on and on and, and get better and better. Um, but that's the thing, you know, like I tell every single person that I work with, I'm going to teach you something and coach you through your first experience where you learn to walk, but then you can change to a ton of different careers. So whenever you decide that this is the end of the road for this one, you can change onto something else. And for me, it's the same thing. Like I tell myself the same thing that if there comes a day where, whether it's because of artificial intelligence or whether it's because, you know, maybe it hasn't taken over this field, but maybe 
it's changed it to where I'm like, ah, it's not, it's taken out the piece that I really like working with. Well, yeah, I can take the tools that I've built or that I've accumulated and I can build another machine. And I think we all have that opportunity. But I mean, aside from the AI assisting in resume writing, or uh, I don't know mm -hmm. the specifics of what it's capable of now. I can imagine it's a lot, but uh, aside from AI assisting in resumes and maybe cover letters, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, do you really think it, it would be able to, I don't think it would be able to replace kind of the, just the motivational, the human aspect of someone encouraging mm -hmm. you along, um, b having commitment for you to you in that mm -hmm. process? I mean, where do you see yeah. that going? So I very much think that there are folks, there's like, you know, very uh, generalizing, right? There's two camps of people um, that I, not camps of people, but two categories where I think as a, as a career seeker, I would choose one versus the other. And one of the camps is I need a resume. I need to do all my interview. I need to get the job. I don't want to talk about like who I am as a mm. person and it's right. And then, yeah. so there's a camp, that camp of people, I think for that group of folks who is seeking strictly, I just need to get hired. Right. Um, artificial intelligence very much can cover the gamut. There's, you know, it's not even chat GPT. I mean, um, there's websites that will literally take your LinkedIn profile. You type in what you want to, like who you want to work for and what position, and it'll actually find people on LinkedIn who might be good for you to connect with. Like this is where the technology is going to where it's giving you templates of emails to send. And that's not showing you how to communicate, but it's giving you examples that you can then model. So there's different pieces like that, where if you want to go straight to, you know, and, and I'm always a fan of saying, if there's a better route than me for you, take that route. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so I think there is that camp of folks who are like, I just need a resume. I can't pay for a career coach. I don't want to go in that deep. Sure. There's artificial intelligence for your resume. There's artificial intelligence. You can you can ask ChatGPT, give me ten questions that um you know that I need to know how to answer if I'm going into UX design. Mm -hmm. Give me ten, you know, like give me you know give me ideas, and so you can do a lot of brainstorming with it. But where I think coaching is evolving to, and I think you're right on this, uh, coaching is evolving to is the more technology comes in, the more we need like you said, human connection, emotional intelligence, resiliency, motivation, like you can get ideas from artificial intelligence. I just don't think that you can truly get that real world motivation when you know there isn't a real person investing in you. And that's really where um, I could see it going like less of a strictly career coach and more <laughs> of like the leadership, motivation, emotional intelligence, um, resiliency, consistency, doing hard things, right? Supporting someone as they're doing the hard things. Um, so that's kind of where I see it going, at least short term. What uh, You had mentioned that you got your master's degree in, in a certain field. What was your undergrad in? Uh, my undergrad was in business administration and human resources. And then the what master's made you go, in counseling. Okay. What, what made you go into your your bachelor's programs why did you pick that particular field because i didn't know any majors and you can do everything <laughs> with them, can't you like <laughs> no hey hey i i i i only laugh only because that's why i went into marketing and undergrad which is because yep. my parents were factory workers i wanted they wanted me to get as far away from that as possible and i'm like okay business I always mm -hmm. liked psychology. So I'm like, okay, marketing, like the psychology of, of how all that works. And so mm -hmm. that's the, that's the only reason I, I laugh is because I can relate to, you know, I didn't know any better. I didn't, yep. me particularly, I didn't have anybody in the family. All my, my parents, friends were blue collar workers. So I was just kind of like, you know, covering my eyes and throwing a dart. Uh, but it worked out. It worked out. Um, Patricia, what does leadership mean to you? And then what does good leadership look like to you? Yeah. Um, I think to me, leadership means investing even when the other person isn't investing. So um, it very much like my faith is really important to me and to me, you know, I, I always kind of try to figure out like, how does this connect? And for me, it's like, you know, they talk about, um, you know, Jesus in the church, husband and wife, like the bride of the church and all, you know, and there's this like self-sacrificial um, component to it. And that's kind of what leadership reminds me of. It reminds me of, you know, I'll give you an example. 
so there's a community, um, there's a community that I'm kind of starting, right? And I'm working with these women and I'm putting out content and I'm not getting feedback. And someone who's not a leader would um, say, I'm not getting feedback, so I'm not going to continue the conversation. But a leader is there when the room is empty, before anyone mm. comes in. And a leader is preparing, getting their message out before anything happens. And then people come and you build something from nothing. That's why you're a leader because you're the first one there. You're building it out. And then everybody comes, gets what they need, and they leave, and you're the last person there. You're the person putting everything away. You're the person that there's no job too big or too small. And at the end of it, you know, the point is not that you get fulfilled, but the point is that people get what they came for, that you built a space, people came, they got what they needed, and that you close the loop on things. That's yeah. the level of investment that would determine a leader for me. No, that's awesome. That's a good point just to bring that um into the definition that it's not just coming in as a leader of a, of a, a group that's already set in stone that you're just mm -hmm. coming in as the person to lead them. Most of the time that that's what happens. But in those moments where you're creating something new, especially as an entrepreneur, especially as a, mm -hmm. a content creator, um, you know, and I've seen everything you've been sharing on LinkedIn, like every day you're posting like those, those little <laughs> snippets of, of all things careers. Um, but yeah, it's like that, that self leadership, getting yourself going, not coming in and, and maintaining or mm -hmm. um, exceeding what's already there, what's already established, but yeah. starting from scratch. I mean, that's the hardest part, especially if at first you don't see those results that are ideal, I guess. Yeah, that's the hard part. So how do you, what, so what is it? What are a couple more thoughts that go through your brain when you, when you may find yourself in situations where you're not getting that reaction that you wanted? How do you keep yourself fired up? You know, so I took a weekend with my husband and we were talking about this exact same thing, you know, and one thing I realized is up until this point, up until I quit my job, things were hard, but they just happened to me, right? So the difficult things that happened happened to me. I had no way of getting out of them. And so I just had to do what I had to do a survival mode, right? You survive or you, you know, you don't, um, and all the good things that happened were natural. Like mm -hmm. I would get in a job and I would move up to the top or I would apply for something and I would get the job. Like it just kind of happened. So all my success, thank God, um, had been just easy, quick. Like it just came to me, just natural. And one of the seasons that I'm in now is in the season of, okay, you've had people mentor you. You've had the guide. You've had the leaders in your life. And it's time for you now to switch roles and to become the leader and to show other people everything that you've learned. And in this season, one thing that I've noticed is that my confidence cannot come from success. It cannot. It has to come from what's not seen. It has to come from the hours I spend scripting, yeah. the hours I spend. You have no idea how many times I re-record so that you can see that 35 second video. Like yeah. I re-record oh, no. <laughs> so many times. <laughs> I, I you know, there it, was a there was a period during the pandemic where I was doing something similar. And yeah, there would yeah. be multiple takes just because oh, you know, yeah. you're your own worst critic, your own worst yeah. enemy. Like, um, God, I love that. Tell me more. Isn't it? Like it's it's those moments. And and I was telling my husband, you know, like I feel like God's on, guiding me on this journey to where. I am becoming confident, not because someone liked the video, but I am becoming confident because I know what it took. No one else knows. I know mm -hmm. the blood, sweat, and tears that it has taken to go from the super cringy very first video to the slightly less cringy videos you see now, right? And eventually, <laughs> they're going to be amazing. And that's because yeah. of the work and the hours that I've put in to honing a craft. It doesn't matter what it is, how popular or unpopular or whatever. The point is you're spending time honing a craft and it's confidence from the amount of time you spent in it. Um, to me, that's the other quality that, you know, comes out of a real leader is someone who is not just a leader because they were placed there, but they have done the work to have this confidence from the inside that doesn't need to be validated from the outside. Yeah, that's insane in a good way. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, even, you know, I'm, I'm 44 years old, but I've realized that just in the last couple of years, mm. um, 
where it wasn't about, um, for me, it wasn't about materialistic success, but I had an idea of what success looked like, mm-hmm. um, where maybe success may have been a goal. And I've talked about this before where it's like a, a point in time in the future. Okay. That's where I want to get to. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's like every day it's in the moments is in creating, yeah. it's in writing, it's in having these kind of conversations where, you know, it's crazy, but every time I get off these conversations right after, after we say goodbye and I shut down, I mean, I have this mm-hmm. feeling of elation because we've created something. We've yeah. created something that speaks from our experiences, that's honest, that's vulnerable, that's raw, that's human. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's before we even see any numbers, we even see any engagement, we even see anyone sharing or commenting on posting this on LinkedIn, whatever it may be. And it's amazing because that's played into a conversation that's come up a few times in the last couple episodes about detaching yourself from that result. Meaning you're going to pour yourself into the practice, which I came up in a a recent episode, uh, a book by coach John Wooden, Wooden on leadership, where he Mm. said in, in the practices, that's where I want you to put the most that you can do. Because when we prepare as much as possible, when we worked on our craft as much as possible, when we get to the game, when we see the score, when we see the reaction from the crowd, we've already done the work. We've put in everything we can. And then by that point, it's like muscle memory. And then you see what you have to work out. But yeah. And and somebody had somebody else had mentioned, I think Edie Clark had mentioned um, when she was doing a presentation, I've mentioned it when I'm speaking. It's almost like we do the reps beforehand. We get up there. We share the value. Obviously, mm-hmm. you hope as business people, you hope that people take away value and they yeah. want to work with you. Of course. Let's not lie. That's why we're on LinkedIn. That's why we do this kind yes. of thing to get our <laughs> there name is out there. There's a reason for this. Of course. Of course. But before any of that, if you aren't happy, fulfilled, successful, in mm-hmm. the creating process, in the sharing process, speaking, writing, yeah. creating content, that to me, I mean, everybody's going to have their own style, but that to me is, is more fulfilling just because I feel that elation here mm-hmm. before any reaction from anybody else. Yeah. So I'm I'm glad that I've learned that, you know, it was later, but it's a process. But I think that's kind of similar to what you're saying is just when you're going through the reps and you see yourself refining little by little, I mean, there's nothing that can match that. No, that's where passion comes in. It doesn't come because you you follow your passion. You take a craft that you are relatively interested in, reasonably interested in, and it becomes your passion over time. Yeah. And again, that's another lesson that I hope younger people take away or hopefully is instilled somewhere along the line when they're in, when they're young, when they're in middle school, high school, where... um you're not kind of working to the reaction, but you're finding somebody, something that fires you up that you see that you seek, you seek and find that fulfillment in just the creation of something, whatever it may be, whatever field it is, whatever Mm -hmm. your specialty may be. Absolutely. We're intended to create for sure. Absolutely. Uh, what were the other questions I just heard you mention? So was it, did you quit your job to start your company? What, what was that? What was that situation? Yeah. So I absolutely loved my prior position. You know, I was a a faculty member, you know, counseling and teaching on and coaching on, you know, education, career and life success. Like those were my three pieces and, you know, the mindset, the resilience wrapped all around that. Um, I loved my colleagues, uh, but there's, you know, there's differences in values. And for me, there was a difference in values and I decided it was time to split ways. Um, And so that's what we did. Um, And, you know, I still very much love and enjoy all my colleagues. Like I enjoy having a relationship with them, talking with them and stuff. Um, And so I took that leap last year in June, almost a year ago now, and kind of started my own coaching practice, um, partly because I just I've always loved to create things and this is creating something out of nothing. And I didn't realize how difficult it would be, but it's still very much appealing to me. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to jump into another position. I'm actually going to make the, make the jump into creating something on my own that I can basically coach people on their career and help them in their journey in exactly the way that, you know, I've learned over my decade plus of focusing on career and life success. So. 
And then I heard you mention your faith. Is that something you developed along the way? Is it something that came from family? I can tell it carries obviously a lot of prominence in your life. Where did that come oh, from? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, so my mom is, has a mental illness. And so I lived my life thinking right was wrong and wrong was right. And I, I would go to sleep and I would pray the rosary with my mom because she just had this thing with religion, which is different in my world from faith. And so she would just have all these religious things, pray the rosary and all this. And I would fall asleep and I'd get pinched and all, you know, the usual stuff. But then I'd go to my room and in my head, I never connected the two, but I would pray to Jesus and just talk to Jesus. And I would look out my window and I would pray like, and it's weird. I wouldn't pray necessarily take me out of this, but I would say, please don't let me go insane. Like, please just don't let me go insane. And so I remember praying that until I was like 11, 12, um, crazy stories around that I ended up putting my dad in jail on false charges because of what my mom had been doing. And then I, you know, took everything back. We got my dad out, restraining order. Um, but all of that, I ended up leaving my house at 16, just a very angry, bitter, like just, this is just a mess on the inside. And, um, you know, did all the things that you're not supposed to do because again, right is wrong and wrong is right, right? The way I was growing up, I would get in trouble if I lied, but my mom would be fine if I, or I would get in trouble if I told the truth, but my mom would be fine if I lied. It was the weirdest thing. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, I went to grad school and eventually, you know, a friend, I think I had hit rock bottom. There was like some ex-boyfriend. It, it just, you know, your life just becomes revolved around a person and they become your savior. And it, like I had done that, I had been like, I'll be fine if I marry, if I get married, I'll be fine if, I'll be fine if. And when all of that went away, I had nothing. Like I didn't even know who I was. I was a shell of a person. And a friend just goes, do you want to read the Bible with me? And my thought was, you're such a weirdo. <laughs> I'm like, you're such a weirdo. But at the same time that I thought you're such a weirdo, immediately my my mind went back to that moment where I'm staring outside my window at 11 o'clock at night, just praying, don't let me go insane. Don't let me go insane. And just having that moment of like, you didn't let me go insane. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. You know? And so I start to read the Bible, you know, I get baptized and there was just this fire that just grew in me that I was like, you, Jesus, you have turned my life from a mess, just an absolute messy show we'll call it <laughs> just just it was just horrible and he has turned it into such a beautiful thing where you know he has cleaned everything up and what i mean by he has cleaned everything up is you know in his word it talks about how to how to live a good life right and so all i've done is follow his word and as i've followed his word it has resulted in every part of my life and as i've trusted him it's resulted in every part of my life just becoming this like beautiful thing that I never in my wildest imaginations could have ever thought possible from, you know, speaking at, you know, on guesting on opportunities like this to, you know, sharing with women. I work with women who come out of human trafficking and to see like the beauty that comes out of some of the conversations we can have that there's no way I could have these conversations if I hadn't gone through what I had gone through you know, meeting my husband and having the conversations that we've gone through. There's just so much fruit that has come out of it. Um, and when it comes back to career, I feel like there's this, you know, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, I have to bring mm. that in. I'm a counselor, right? But if you are in survival mode, you can't think about anything else. And so yeah. I feel like career, focusing on career is a way to say, let's get you set up practically, logically. Let's help in some ways, turn soil. Like I can't tell you how many times I meet with someone who happens to be a little anxious or nervous or defensive. And, you know, in some ways I get emotionally beat up a little bit sometimes, you know, because there's the, this like conflict going on in someone, which they want to say they're great at X, Y, Z, but they're struggling that they can't get to this other place. And so they take it out on me as, you know, and so like, I feel like coaching is this place where I meet you exactly where you're at, wherever that is. We take care of things practically, but while we're doing that, there are other pieces. Like we talk about relationships. When we talk about networking, it's not just send this email to this person. We mm -hmm. go in depth about relationships and why is it, why do I feel a little slimy when I'm reaching out to someone? Is it, <laughs> is there a bit of pride? Is it a bit of, do we need grace? Is it a, hu a humility issue? Is it like relationally? And this is where my counseling side comes in relationally. What is it that stops us from connecting with people that 
could result in, you know, mutually beneficial relationships. When you go into the interview, why is it that you blank out? We get nervous, but we get nervous because we're being evaluated. Well, let's go back to the moments in your life when you were judged. Let's go back to the moments in your life when you were evaluated. Like, how do we let go of some of those moments and realize we are in a different place in a different time? We are different people. And right now, this is what's factual. This is what's beneficial for us. Yeah. And that plays into a conversation I also had here where we talked about um, reprogramming childhood traumas. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. And just in talking those conversations, I swear to God, this <laughs> this series is like my therapy where I've just right? learned so much about people and myself um, where when you start having those conversations, you realize like the little quirks that you have in your life, the little things that you do or don't do that lead you down a good path or a bad path, mm -hmm. whether it's your thoughts, whatever it may be, how much it's programmed into you just because it's all you've ever known in your life since you were a kid. You know, yeah. and they could be big traumas. They could be little subtle actions that you went through mm -hmm. that people wouldn't consider traumas. You know, trauma is not just abuse. It's not just yeah. um, death. It could be, you know, everyday little things that kind of chip away at you. Mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate you sharing that all so much because I, it plays into everybody's story where, again, that, that's a great example. When you go in and you freeze up and you're worried about what someone's going to think about you and, and what the result might be, where does that come from? And then how yeah. do you break that knowing that that was the reality then you're still thinking through that lens of that young child yeah. and that you have a little bit more control now that it's not the same kind of situation, but it's amazing how much those little traumas that are, you know, programmed into our brains still impact the way that we move forward. Absolutely. Yeah. That's key. Thank you so much for sharing that, Patricia. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. The book, I must admit, I did read the book when it first came out. Um, and I, I haven't looked at it since, but I have it here. This is the book that Patricia is going to go over. But Patricia, can you introduce the book? Um, introduce the book and how you came to find the book. And then we can go into the value that you took out of the book. Yeah, absolutely. So um, building a storybook book brand uh, or story brand is basically, it's a book by Donald Miller. And he takes the concept that so many are already using to sell. And this is storytelling. So he breaks down the concept that Disney uses that, you know, um, every film studio, you know, uses. And that is that there is a character who has a problem, who meets a guide, who gives them a plan, who calls them to action and basically helps them to reach success and avoid failure. And that is the arc of nearly every film, every story that you'll see. And so what Donald Miller does is he takes that framework and he applies it specifically to building a business, building a brand, building. And he he talks of it from the standpoint of you're an online business or you're a brick and mortar business. Um, so originally I came across it because I was part of Flip Lifestyle with Shane Sam. So I was part of his mastermind and he recommended it. And so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll read the book as an entrepreneur. But as I'm reading it, immediately I realized this is useful for a professional brand too. And I don't think enough folks talk about um, branding. We talk about professional branding, but we don't connect the dots between storytelling and professional branding enough. I don't think we connect the dots between your professional brand and like marketing, like true marketing. I don't think we really do that as well as we could. Um, and that's why I'd like to kind of come and fill in the gap um, because the, the book, as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, the character, the hero, right? Yes, in some senses, the professional is the hero, but in some senses, the company, say you want to work for Apple, you build a story where Apple is the hero, right? Because who are you trying to persuade? Who are you, right? Like who, wh what is your purpose? And that's what determines who the hero is because you want to tell it from the, per from the perspective of the person whose attention you want to capture. So it's like, okay, the Apple is the character and then what's the problem? What's the industry problem? What, what edge is Apple trying to get that other companies maybe have an edge on right now? Or what is the, if you look at the job description, especially if you have insider information, what is the problem they're trying to solve with this position? And oftentimes the 
the problem is seen as a villain. So you personify it, right? And that's what Donald Miller's book talks about. And so it's like, okay, you have this problem. This problem might be, you know, not a large enough budget for research and development. Well, now you have to get like really in depth and and spend some time thinking about like, what does that mean? What does that look like? How can you help, right? Um, And so in a professional brand, the guide, right? Normally the guide would be the coach or something, right? But in a professional brand, I feel like the guide is the candidate. So the hero is the company who has a problem and in comes the candidate and they are the guide. They are Mm -hmm. the one who says, hey, Apple, you have everything you need. You have all the resources, but I'm just going to help you make it happen. I'm going to help you connect the dots. And so then the plan Mm -hmm. is basically what comes out in their resume, in their interview, right? So that a character, Apple, has a problem, meets a guide, that's the candidate, gives them a plan. So for example, I've gone into into, uh, interviews where I'm coming from a completely different industry, completely different industry. And I've been told in interviews, Oh, it's like you're perfect for this role. But why? That's because you design a plan that says, let me position the skills that I have that you normally wouldn't have in a candidate like me because I come from a different industry. Let me position those skills as part of the plan to solve your problem. So you've got the character, the problem, they meet a guide who gives them a plan and then calls them to action. And this is where the emotional piece I feel comes in, where you're in the interview and to give an employer permission to hire you involves calling on their emotions, involves giving them permission, and involves calling them to action in the sense of you have to make a decision. And so in the interview, some of the best things you can do is to come in and be the leader. So lead in excitement, lead in enthusiasm, Mm -hmm. lead in confidence that you are the person to take on this role. Not because you're perfect, but because you have the, the inner qualities. You don't have to have all the outer skills packed. What you have to have is the resourcefulness, the resiliency, the willingness, the, you know, the, the ability to say, I don't know it now, but I am confident I'm going to figure it out. We're going no matter who you hire, you're going to come across some issues. And I promise you, I will be the one who's not going to flounder out those issues. I'll be the one who's going to keep going and we're going to figure this out together. And so that's kind of calling them to action is pulling out the emotion pulling out the the trust and having enough confidence in yourself so that they have permission to make the decision to hire you even if you're not the quote unquote most qualified candidate because the most qualified candidate can also sit on their butt all day and just want to do their job, right? So so that's how I saw story brand like I read it for my business and then I realized this needs to be implemented in the career space as well. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I haven't read it in a while, but that was something that stood out. I think maybe I read it right before the pandemic started. Um, so there obviously, you know, it's a, it, the title is, or on the cover it says, you know, build a story, building a story brand to clarify your message. So customers will listen, use the seven elements of great storytelling to grow your business. Um, so I think I read it towards the beginning of the pandemic but it made sense because as I was kind of realizing the power of storytelling just from the pandemic, like I said before, living in this virtual world uh, that Mm -hmm. people really weren't clear on, on sharing who they were and they started to open up a little more Then you started to hear the stories. Then this, this, uh, this book came across my path, but it's funny that much in the same way you, you said you read it for the business aspect there are parallels here for the individual, for the professional, for the, for our stories. Again, it it came in at an opportune time because I realized just how bad we are at storytelling. So, I mean, I just found a a great tool that it gives you that those steps about who is it that needs help being the guide, coming up with the plan, the resources. Um, Yeah. I just can't overestimate how important storytelling is. And what I love that you just brought up was um, the ability for somebody not to have the technical experience enough technical experience, but not having it down pat. But I just hope it gets to the point where companies realize that that story that they tell that that resourcefulness, they want to bring to the table, that Mm -hmm. curiosity that they want to bring to the environment that, that, you know, you can train the skills, but all that other stuff, you can't buy that. You can't train that, that, 
people can learn it. They can pick it up over time. But when somebody shows up at your door with those skills and that drive, I mean, that's something to harness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What, um, so what, so you read the book, was it immediately that you tied it into your coaching work? Did, did it evolve over time? Um, how much did your work change because of, of the book, Patricia? You know, so before I read the book, I worked with this amazing woman on LinkedIn. She actually, her name's Kate Spear. Check her out on LinkedIn. Um, she is a marketer by trade. And she, you know, was in a career transition where she was trying to get hired. And she did, she put into words what I feel like I've been thinking and saying, but it just hasn't been as clear. Like she went through and created a YouTube video, like a video resume for herself. She created a marketing campaign. She created a website. She started a podcast, like all to show just the potential. Um, and she did a really great job. And so I had her on the episode. She's on the Uncommon Career. And um, we're actually going to we're going to touch base again because when I met with her, she had started her marketing campaign and now she's gotten hired. So that'll be exciting. And so now we're going to kind of see full circle what it's like. But this was before. Um, and then I worked with someone else actually where the marketing piece came up again, where she was also a marketer. I happened to work with a lot of folks in marketing. But um, I was explaining to her the resume from the perspective of a marketer and she got it. Like she got it so quickly. Oh, this is a marketing piece got it. Now I know what to do. Right. And so, um, it's been kind of brewing. Uh, mm. and when I, I've also read, you know, Seth Godin's, um, books mm. on marketing, he has so many of them and they're so good. They talk about serving and how, when you go into the interview, um, he didn't talk about the interview, but I kind of connect the dots of when you go into an interview, your goal is to serve them. Well, how do you serve someone at an interview? Well, you make sure that you answer everything from their perspective. You connect it back to how it's going to help them, not how it makes you shine. Like you're showing that, but you always connect it back to what it's going to mean for them and their company and their bottom line, right? So um, yeah. I had already been connecting the dots on marketing and career, but when I read Story Brand, it was like this all-encompassing, like your professional brand needs an overhaul to focus on your story and how do you pull pieces on your story and things like that. So it was kind of a confirmation and a nudge yeah. at the same time. And I mean, just when you pointed out to that woman that your resume is a marketing piece, mm -hmm. you know, typically I think we go through high school thinking about the resume later in college and grad school, whatever it may be. We look at that mm -hmm. just kind of as a piece of paper listing a compliment accomplishments to date. You show up, um, mm -hmm. they see what you've done. You can put a couple sentences together, uh, answer a couple questions about your experience and that's it. But to turn it around, I mean, the way that you've explained it, that really has to be an intentional exercise and practice beforehand mm -hmm. to understand where you are and how you can convey that to somebody. And for all the, the career preparation that I've ever helped with or volunteered for at universities, I've never seen it put quite like that and mm -hmm. if somebody looks at it instead of a list of your accomplishments what is this what do you want to show them you know it's yeah. not just here's the list of my stuff that reconciles to your job description here's the stuff that's going to blow this place apart and deliver mm -hmm. as much as i can for you i'm worth someone invest uh worth investing in oh, um yeah. But it has to be, it really has to be that conscious understanding that it's not just a list of accomplishments. Mm -hmm. It's it's like your, your brochure of how you're going to yeah. turn that story around for them. Yeah. Yeah. For that specific job. Because everyone puts everything on their resume. And I'm like, you know, congratulations on all your life accomplishments. None of them are to be minimized. But the person reading your resume is not your mom. The person reading your resume is a manager who has one thing in mind, and that is how do I solve this problem and move the bottom line? So you figure out everything that they prioritize, what's most important to them, put that at the top. What is related to that, put that in the middle. Everything else, you just cut it right out. You have a great skill in video editing, that is awesome. Is it not at all related to your position? Cut it out because what you're doing is you're just adding clutter around the gold and now they can't see it. Yeah, everything else gets buried in. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Patricia, you had mentioned your podcast. Can you 
go into that just a little bit? Like what made you launch the podcast? What was your intention? What were some mm-hmm. of the guests? Like what kind of uh, guests do you have on there? What what's What's the mission of your podcast? What are you trying to get out there? Yeah. So the mission of the podcast, um, you know, to be very frank and honest, is right now I feel like I look at career just a little bit differently than I think I've heard in the past. And so I thought, let me just start sharing thoughts and having conversations with people to sort of start sifting out and figuring out like how this looks. Um, And in having those conversations with folks, there's more and more people who have been approaching saying, I haven't thought of it this way, but it makes Mm -hmm. so much more sense. And I feel like I know how to better communicate because of the lens that I'm seeing it through now. And so I think more clarity will come. Um, And, you know, right now I'm interviewing folks from all different sort of communication experts. I interviewed a relationship expert. Um, I've interviewed folks who have made the career climb themselves. I've interviewed folks who, um, there's a Harsh, he's actually on LinkedIn as well. So I interviewed Harsh and he helps um, people with little to no experience get into technology. And so Mm. he talks about, you know, how to do those entrepreneurial tasks to get the certain certificates and how to research them and then how to present yourself as someone who may be new to the field, but now you have a new perspective, right? So I'm really just aiming to interview almost anybody that I can have a conversation with. And if in that conversation, I can see things that can help other people think differently about their careers and recognize that they are entrepreneurs in their careers and that they can make any change they want. It's a matter of the mindset first, the marketing second, and the communication of it all third. Then really we have almost any door open to us that we want. And Patricia, what, what should companies be doing? Like the world is changing. Obviously the pandemic uh, Mm -hmm. expedited that change, that evolution. How do you think, companies should look at the workforce differently? Yeah. You know, I, I talked with Brian uh, Montez. He's on the um, the Uncommon Career podcast as well. And one of the things that he and I talk about at length is this idea that the ask a question at the interview and then decide who you're going to hire. Like those days are kind of over. It's really more comprehensive where it's not just the employer asking and vetting for the right employee. That's really something that happened like earlier in the, in, you know, the, um, 1900s, you know, the, the more advanced we get in technology, the more people have options, you know, this, because this world has become so flat, I don't need to just look at the corner store and the one down the street. I have every opportunity in the world and I can even work virtually around the world. Mm -hmm. So to me, this means, in, as in terms of like grabbing and getting the best talent, it involves not just the pay anymore. It's the culture. It's the flexibility. It's the natural connection. You know, you hear it plastered everywhere that people don't quit jobs. They quit bosses. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a culture where it's okay to not treat your employees well, then chances are you're just no matter how much you pay them, you're not going to get the best employees. And so to me – switching things up and making the hiring process like a true let's get to know each other is are you going to be like on a basketball team are you going to be good for the dynamics of the team as opposed to is your skill set alone what we need to get the job done it's more of like together is there going to be a positive synergy here and before i even get into the interview table as an employer have i done the work that i need to do have i been the leader setting up the foundation mm-hmm. when no one is here when nobody wants to so that when someone comes in they realize i don't really care about many of the aspects that i normally would what i really want is to work here to get the experience and to build these relationships are there any other areas of the book that stand out Patricia, before we start wrapping up, is there anything that stands out in terms of what he shares and stories, examples, anything at all? Um, I think there is, yeah, there's, there's a part of the story. It talks about the guide. And if you have a business, you are not the hero, the candidate or the, if you have a business, the client is the hero, right? So you focus on the client. You have to get to know the client really well. Well, if you're a candidate, 
you are not the hero. If you're a candidate, you're the guide and the company is the hero, which means that you now need to target and research and get to know and start interacting with the company. Um, And this is, you know, there, if you just need a job, then just write a resume, get a job. But if you want a job that reflects the worth of all the skills that you have spent valuable time earning, and if you know who you are, what culture you thrive in, and what kind of mission you want to move forward, that's really who I'm talking about is people who are like, okay, I don't want to move forward just any mission. Like I want a targeted mission. I don't want to just be at any company. I want to be at a company with a culture. Literally, it naturally helps me as a person to thrive. So if you want those kinds of positions that are just a true fit to you, that's when you go into the storytelling framework. That's when you say, okay, well, you know, um, I am the guide, so I'm going to do my research and find out who this hero really is and figure out how I as the guide can help this hero kind of meet their, um, solve their problem. What skill sets do I have that directly relate to that? How do I flesh out the problem so that when I go into the interview, I can speak about the problem to where they're confident that I know what I need Mm -hmm. to solve. And now that's like I'm building trust. And so now they can basically have permission and be confident in hiring me because not only have I done the research, I understand the problem and I have given them essentially the solution, right? Yeah. To how to solve that problem. Awesome. Um, yeah, I can't stress enough just how important it is. I love the fact that you did start reading the book for one reason, your business, but then realized just how applicable story branding storytelling is to, to all areas, especially candidacy and jobs. Again, I can't, I can't overstate just how much people just don't realize that their story should be applied to the way that they prepare for a job. So I think that's Mm -hmm. key. Um, at this point, getting closer to wrapping up, um, is there anything that you want to share, Patricia, about the work you're doing, what you may have coming up, uh, any information about the podcast, anything that I might have missed, anything you want to share, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I've got a podcast. It's called the Uncommon Career Podcast. So um, subscribe, listen in, we'll we'll grow together. Um, I also am doing a 30-day video series on LinkedIn on all things career and, and what we might cover if we were to do a comprehensive career coaching program together. It's just kind of snippets of things to think about throughout your career process. Um, and then I do coaching packages. And so because I work on the mindset, the resiliency, the identity, confidence, and all of that, and everything flows from that, um, I do three month coaching packages. So I focus on the comprehensive piece as opposed to piecing out like just the resume or just the interview. Um, and all of that, you know, is available. I'll send you the link um, for anyone that wants to either book a call or, you know, I also have a checklist freebie if you just want to um, kind of get a feel for the type of work that I do. Uh, but yeah, you know, the, probably the best thing you can do if you were to do one thing right now, it'd be head over to LinkedIn. Um, and then follow me for that hashtag 30 day career and you catch all the videos there. Yeah. And I think especially people that even have jobs already mm-hmm. should look oh, into yeah. this as well. Like it's not just for when you need it, when you're between jobs, but even mm-hmm. when you're in a job, just because oh, yeah. that kind of attention to what you can bring to the table can help you even just in elevating your career, even if you don't want to leave the job that you're in. Mm -hmm. Right. Am I right, Patricia? I mean, I I, I see so much value in that. Just getting your brand set can even help you get a promotion within the organization that you're currently at, you know, and and to to invest because it is an investment, right? To invest in yourself when you no longer have your job. If you are pressured to get the next job, it may not be the right time. And I've worked with folks where I'm like, ooh, if you feel pressured to get the job, you're um, need for a position, which is a very real need is going to conflict with the work that we need to do. Cause it's hard work to get past those mindset issues and to value your worth. So as we're trying to work on your value, you're working on, I just need money. Right. And so yeah. sometimes it's like, okay, great. Let's get, you know, let's spend the first few weeks getting you into a position ASAP and it doesn't have to be the greatest one, but then once yeah. you're stable, then let's work on like the position, you know? Yeah. I mean, as somebody who's been laid off in his career, um, I understand that urgency or just the change in urgency going from I have a job to now Mm -hmm. I don't and my back is up against the wall. So 
it's yeah. always better obviously to prepare when you're in control or you know when you still have the job as opposed to when you need it um mm -hmm. just constant practice constant evolution those constant reps mm -hmm. that we talked about absolutely absolutely all right thank you patricia for sitting down with me for this conversation, building a story brand, clarifying your message so customers will listen. Again, it's applicability to just the personal story and how we reflect ourselves, our best selves for jobs, for promotions, mm -hmm. even just in life. Um, it's amazing to come across something like this because I, I know that we forget how to tell our own stories. It's mm -hmm. the way we're programmed. We just have to reprogram ourselves. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. And if there's anything... If there's anything that I might have missed, there's so much to cover, limited time, let me know. I'll reach out to Patricia, see if I can get some feedback or some responses, um, kind of continue that conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining me for this particular episode. It's amazing how all these episodes, the messages kind of crisscross and cross section. Mm -hmm. um, it just reminds me how similar our stories are, what we're going through. Um, yeah. That's one thing it's shown me is, is how different we're not that many of us go through similar stories, similar challenges, even if we're in different careers, different specialties, mm -hmm. um, those stories are very common um, and we're more co connected than we know. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, in any case, thank you for watching and listening. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.